Okay. All right. Tonight's lecture is going to be an introduction to hero myths. This is the, the big lecture, I guess you could say, where we're going to cover all the important things that we're going to be able to come back to as we go through the various stories as the rest of the semester progresses. Okay. So we're going to start uh, and I'm going to break this lecture, like I said, into two sections. We're going to start with just an introduction to heroes and the heroic narrative. And then we're going to get into the whole idea of what's called the monomyth, the hero's journey, and different patterns that I want you guys to recognize. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot of material, but it actually is. And um, I'm going to go ahead and we'll get us started with this intro. Now, You've probably heard of heroes before. I mean, this, the term is not strange. Almost everybody has an idea of what it means to be a hero or have a picture that pops into mind when you hear the word hero, uh, whether it's, you know, modern superheroes or mythological heroes or just people that you admire that you hold up as sort of a role model type of a figure. But I want to get um, a little bit more of a definition behind the concept, and I'm going to try to point out what I think is an essential characteristic of heroism and distinguish that from other what we call accidental characteristics that are maybe common but not necessary for being a hero. So let's get into definitions first. We always start with definitions. I know it's not sometimes a little bit boring to talk definition. And some of this, by the way, we've already covered in our introductory lecture on mythology. So we talked about pseudo-historical mythology, if you remember that, or pseudo-historical myth. This is where we're talking about the stories that people believe to be history, that they believe were true stories, that gave a culture a sense of past, uh, a sense of purpose. The ones that are believed, right? These are the characters that are the most developed, right? You've got really complex personalities, and they're the stories that we tend to resonate with, right? You've got the more than human figures that have their failings, their frailties. They've got personalities that are flawed, a lot like ourselves. Not, not every character has flaws. You're going to see some stories that we're going to do this semester where the characters are almost too good to be true. But for the most part, the standard mythological hero is one that is very much like ourselves. Um, and that's one of the reasons when the motion picture industry makes action films and, you know, stories that are mythic or based on myth, they're pulling from the hero stories and they're not pulling from creation narratives or fertility myths or other types of stories because those tend not to be as dynamic. They're not as deep. They're not as complicated as these heroic legends. So I gave you some definitions, legend, saga, epic. I'm just going to revisit those briefly so you have in mind what we mean by the term. So a legend we'll say is a myth that we apply to an individual personality. Uh, it's possibly based on some historical reality. So in other words, there's some kind of core truth behind it. It's either at least promoted as true, or there actually was some historical event that maybe got embellished along the way and passed down in some oral tradition and is manifested in a legend that um, usually complicates the actual history. So again, they're believed to be true, they're set in the real world, and their characteristics of the characters are very much realistic. Um, they can be sacred. They could be secular. doesn't matter whether this is a religious hero. Some traditions have these kinds of sacred figures that's supposed to be, you know, role models within different faith traditions. But you could also have secular figures that represent more of a national identity. And these stories are going to teach. They're going to inform. They're going to warn. They're also going to be entertaining. And the example that I'm going to give you here is the story of King Arthur as a legend. We're going to look at that story later this semester, and it is probably one of the most famous legends out there. As a matter of fact, there's more stuff written about King Arthur than any other mythological character in the history of Western literature. Um, and the picture that I've got on the screen, of course, is King Arthur. Hopefully you know this scene. If anybody is familiar with the Arthurian legend, the, um, the uh, giving of Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake. And uh, on the other side, you also have a very famous story, which I'll get to in a second because I guess it's listed down below. But OK, so that's legend. Uh, saga. And these terms, by the way, can be used interchangeably, though there are distinct differences if you, you know, were to look these words up. Saga actually comes from the Norse word meaning to say, and we're here now talking about a myth or legend as applied to a series of events, right? This is how we're going to stipulate the definition. Um, could be covering 
generations within a family could be a number of um, families or characters interwoven in a very complex narrative. And again, it's rooted in history, purported to be history, and uh, passed off in that way. And the one big saga that we're going to look at later this semester, which is one of my favorite stories, is the Volsunga saga, which is a Norse story. Now, the word saga, remember, comes from the Norse. But we tend to use these terms interchangeably today, right? We could talk about something being a legend or a saga at the same time. We can talk about, uh, I think I've even used the example of Star Wars, right? The Star Wars saga. We use that term to apply to, you know, big events, big stories, multi-part stories and things like that. So... Um, the original definition has been obviously expanded. The third term that you've got on the screen is epic, and epic is really a style of poetry, right? If you want to be strict about it, it's a long narrative poem, and it usually recounts heroic events. So all of the great epics in world literature usually deal with heroes. Um, Gilgamesh will fall into that category. It was a poem. Uh, the Iliad and the Aeneid are the two that I've got on the screen there. And of course, here's the picture of the famous Trojan horse. If you don't know that aspect of the story, that is actually not mentioned in the Iliad. It's actually mentioned in the Aeneid, um, but we'll cover both of those stories later on, but they're epics. Now, every once in a while, you'll come across a story that's called an epic, all right? Um, that is not typically or te technically a poem. So, for instance, I've heard the Volsunga saga referred to as a prose epic. Um, in that sense, again, we use the term in a broader way. It's not necessarily always use of poetry, though that's, you know, is strictly speaking what it is. So um, epics will include legend and saga, okay? So that's, that's good enough as a background for those terms. Let's get into some other stuff. And I'm going to not rush through the first part of this lecture because I really want you guys to understand what it means when we say something is a hero. And we're going to start with the essential characteristics. So if you ever study philosophy, um, particular classical tradition of philosophy, you might hear terms like essential, accidental, and those two terms distinguish what we would call the characteristics one has to have in order to be classified in a particular way, and then those characteristics that are not necessary but are very common, which we would say accidental. So if I was talking about human beings, uh, if you're an essentialist, you would say, you know, what it means to be human is that you have certain essential characteristics, things that are true of human nature, things that all human beings share in common, like being mammals, um, being warm-blooded, being rational, um, you know, having emotions, various aspects of, you know, the idea of humanity would be the essentials. And if you're missing what would be essential, like, you know, if you're not a mammal, for instance, then, of course, you wouldn't be a human because part of what it means to be human is to be a mammal. All right, so that's an idea of what we mean by essential. They need to be there. They're necessary characteristics. Accidental characteristics would be things like skin color, hair color, um, the things that can be different from one person to another. They don't make you human, okay? They're individuating um, features, but since they're not essential, you know, if you don't have blonde hair, it doesn't mean you're not human anymore. That's what we mean by accidental. So I'm going to give you, starting with um, the essential characteristics as far as what is a hero. And the first one is you have to be a role model. And what I mean by role model is not somebody that you admire. What I mean is you have to be a character or a figure that models or even challenges the virtues and values of a society, all right? So this sense, it's somewhat culturally dependent because there are different virtues and values of different cultures, right? Maybe uh, um, a culture like ancient Britain might have different virtues and values than might be recognized in ancient China. But there are also virtues and values that tend to be transcultural, right? Certain things that we can recognize across the board. Um, if you ever study, you know, a uh, philosophy like moral philosophy or ethics, you'll come across some of these types of discussions. You know, are there universal virtues, values, stuff like that? Um, I think when you start reading the stories from around the world, it, you're bound to come across common virtues and values. So a hero is going to try to model those virtues and values. They're going to try in sometimes um, ways to challenge them. Maybe they're going to critique the virtues and values of society and try to put forth a, a higher virtue or a higher value. And even though these heroes are very often flawed and don't perfectly model the virtues and values, they'll at least be useful in 
teaching these things, okay? So the hero is supposed to be not just a model, but they're, what, what they're teaching really is how to live. And maybe even more important than that, they're there to teach you how to die, okay? And this whole theme of death, we're going to come back to this over and over again tonight and over the course of the rest of the semester because I can use that term in a few different ways. But dying is a very, very important deed, I guess you could say, of a hero, okay? And I'll unpack that a little bit later. So that's, that's number one. You have to be a role model. You have to be that type of character. Now, out of the various virtues that the heroes are going to have to model, the paramount virtue, I think, is the virtue of courage, extraordinary courage. And I'm using the word extraordinary because hero has to stand out from the crowd. They've got to be something beyond the ordinary for them to really count, okay? If their courage is at the same level as everybody else, then they're not going to be a hero. Or your definition of hero is going to be so broad as to be meaningless, right? If a, if a definition isn't precise enough and includes too many things, um, then it doesn't rule out enough to be of value, right? All of a sudden, you know, if your definition is so broad, then it's just going to be synonymous with being human, right? Everybody's a hero. Well, that's not going to work, okay? We want something a little bit more precise. Now, here's the question for you guys, and you could, you know, text this if you'd like. Um, what does that have to do with fear, right? Because fear and courage have a relationship, right? The emotion of fear. Now, when you think of courage, what comes to mind? Just go ahead and text me. Uh, does it mean for you an absence of fear? All right. Okay, very good. That's, that's actually exactly what I was trying to hopefully get somebody to give me. It's the idea of courage is the ability to do something even when you're afraid. As a matter of fact, I would say fear is essential to courage. All right. The person without fear is not a courageous person. Okay. The person without fear doesn't need courage. The whole idea of courage is a way of mastering the emotion, right? To be able to act in spite of your fear. So that's what we mean by courage. And to illustrate a little bit about courage and its importance in heroism, I always pick, you know, my favorite movies. And today, a scene from another Batman film. I know I've shown clips from the Batman trilogy before. This is a scene from the third movie which is The Dark Knight Rises. Hopefully I've got the volume adjusted correctly. So go ahead and watch this scene. Try to listen to what this guy says about fear. This is, by the way, the scene where Bruce Wayne, if you've seen the movie, the scene where Bruce Wayne is in the prison. He's been you know, trapped down there by Bane. He's been recovering from his broken back. And he's been wanting to get out of this, this, this prison, this pit. So listen to what this guy says. He's got kind of a heavy accent, so it might be hard to, to catch, but... Just listen for a second. You do not fear death. You think this makes you strong. It makes you weak. Why? How can you move faster than possible? Fight longer than possible without the most powerful impulse of death, period. The fear of death. I do fear death. I fear dying in here. On my city grounds. Oops. Let me try that again. I heard some of you, yeah, you can't hear it. Let me let me bump up the volume and then I'll replay the clip. Um give me a second. Okay, let's let's let me back this up and try this again from the beginning. All right, give it a shot. You do not fear that. You think this makes you strong. It makes you weak. Why? How can you move faster than possible? Fight longer than possible without the most powerful impulse of this period? The fear of death. I do fear death. I fear dying in here. On my city grounds. There's no one there to save it. Then make the climb. <laughs> As the child is.
درد رو Okay, now you might not have heard that very clearly. Uh, the volume is a little bit low, and I think that's just the clip. But if you did hear it, or actually if you didn't hear it, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about what they were saying. Um, you know, he said, you know, how can you, you know, fight longer than possible and, you know, push yourself to this limit without the most, you know, primitive emotion of all, which is fear, fear of death, right? So... He says, you know, you know, he does fear. He fears dying in here while the city burns and all that kind of stuff. And at the end, if you don't know what he's referring to, when he says make the climb, right, they're in this prison and people have been trying to get out the whole time. And he's been trying to do this climb with this rope tied around him. Okay. And what the rope does, of course, is it gives you a safety net, right? If you don't make the climb, if you don't make the leap, then you'll fall, but you won't die. So he says to make the, make the um, climb the way the child did. And if you know the movie, you know, there's only one person that's ever gotten out of this prison, and that's this child that made it out. And he says, make the climb the way the child did without the rope, right? So, and then fear will find you again. So it's this motivating factor, okay? But, you know, you know, if you're afraid of death, you're going to push yourself just that much further. But the idea is you are doing it in spite of the fear. At the same time that the fear is motivating you, it's the courage that's going to allow you to do this. And if you know the way the movie goes, of course, he goes ahead and makes the climb without any safety net, right? It's this really traumatic mo uh, part of the movie. And the whole theme of rising from the pit that you see in this movie is kind of set up in the first Batman movie. We'll talk about it when we deal with the movie a few weeks from now. But um, this is a major, major theme in hero stories, which we're going to take a look at. So extraordinary courage is an essential characteristic. You can't be a hero without it. Okay, and then the third and final characteristic, so I'm only giving you three essentials, is the character needs to be a provider or a savior. When I say provider, I mean a provider for a way of life or somebody that provides life to others, often at the expense of their own life. The hero is the one who's willing to die so that others can live. They're the character that goes out and protects society, protects other people. You know, this is the, the one who you know, rides in to save the people um, from the monster. There are all different ways that the hero is going to be somebody that intervenes between the threat and the society that they're defending. Okay, so we call that a, a savior figure. I think those are essential. If you don't have any one of the three, then in some way you're going to be deficient or not a hero at all. Okay, so those are the essential characteristics. And now let's look at some of the accidental characteristics. What I mean by accidental, remember, they're not essential. You don't have to have any of these, but these are also very, very common. So as we go through various characters in the course of this semester, you're going to see how many of these characteristics are there, such as being semi-divine. This is pretty standard, especially for Greek heroes, right? You've got this idea that the, the character is part god, part man. They're, they're these intermediate figures that stand between two realms. Uh, it's kind of the same thing as a provider and savior in the sense that they're the person that stands between society and the things that threaten society or between life and the things that threaten life. So they're intermediary here too. You don't have to be, of course, semi-divine to be a hero, but most of them are. Not, not even all the Greek characters are. I mean, we're going to read some Greek heroes that aren't semi-divine either, but um, a good majority are. The greatest example probably being Heracles or more commonly known as Hercules. Noble. A lot of the characters are upper class, right? They're kings or princes. They're great warriors from the nobility. Very rarely will you see a traditional story about just the, the average person um, as a hero, national hero or something like that, okay? But again, these are accidental. Then you've got the idea of being greater in size and strength and um, presence, right? Again, Heracles is a good example. He's big. He's strong. He's way beyond the average person. But again, these are not necessary. And then the fast one, for, uh, last one, they're generally characters that are favored by the gods. They've got some special relationship to a divine um, patron. Um, doesn't mean, again, the way the polytheistic cultures often work is even if you have favor by some of the gods, there's always these other gods that are out to get you because they're not always on the same page. But I think you got the idea. Okay? So those are accidental. Uh, next week, you guys are reading Gilgamesh, and you're reading Chi Li. When you're reading those two stories, I want you to actually think about essential versus accidental characteristics and try to measure Gilgamesh against Chi Li uh, just as a comparison. And we'll talk very, very briefly about Chi Li. I probably won't spend a lot of time on the story, but it's a great example of a hero story, though 
there are some differences between the big stories that we're going to cover. Okay, so that's basically what a hero is. But I also need to clarify the difference between what I would call an objective view of heroism and a subjective view of heroism. Back in the day, I used to assign students the task of writing a paper about heroes, what they think of a hero. You guys are still doing something like that this semester, but you're probably also familiar with the terms objective and subjective, though people tend to get these confused. I don't know. Um, it's just maybe a, that they're not taught as clearly as they ought, the differences between the two terms. But what we mean first by objective heroes or objective heroism, we're talking about measuring a hero against certain standards. This is what I was trying to give you when I give you an essential definition. The idea that the character is going to be a role model that exemplifies certain virtues or cultural standards. Okay, And the role model in this sense doesn't mean just somebody that you admire. That's important Okay, because it's not based on the viewer. That would be the subjective concept of heroism. Right? This is going to be a hero according to personal admiration, how the person is perceived. So there may be people in your life that you think of as a hero, somebody that you consider a role model or inspires you. It could be a family member or a teacher or somebody like that. And that's fine, but that's not what we're talking about here. Okay? Um, again, it seems to be a little bit of a softer view of heroism because, again, it's going to be way too broad. Um, so the hero is, in that sense, is really telling, is more of an expression of the viewer than the actual character, okay, if that makes sense. Um, and like I said, it's, it's too broad of a definition to be useful for a course like this. So if you do write a paper that deals with this idea of, you know, heroism, I want you to try to, uh, try to deal with it objectively, if at all possible, okay? So that's why I'm giving you these criteria, so that you could pick out what measures up and what disqualifies, you know, or, or rules somebody out as a hero. All right, so that's what I mean by those two terms, and I think those are on the study guide. Now, let's talk about the heroic narrative. This is where we're going to slow down a little bit. We're going to spend most of this lecture and the next one dealing with the hero narrative. There are essential elements of a narrative the same way there are essential characteristics of a hero. Number one, and I gave you this in the beginning of the semester, it's a transformation tale. The heroic narrative is about transformation. The character, if it's a well-written story or a well-developed tradition, will transform in some way over the course of the tale. All right? They're dynamic figures. They're not static. It's one of the reasons we can identify with them, because they're like us. We change over the course of our lifetime. And remember, change is not easy, but it's often necessary to become the person that you need to be, okay? It's required for success. And the successful hero's journey is going to result in a transformation of the character along the way. All right, so keep that in mind. I'll, I'll be drilling this stuff in so that you get so sick of it, you won't forget it. Now, there are two essential elements, I think, for the heroic narrative, meaning there are two things every hero story must have. The first one is an adversary. Now, an adversary, you could say a villain, the bad guy, doesn't have to be a person. It could be, a, you know, a, it could be a monster. It could be even a situation that the hero needs to deal with that is a threat that is um, going to force the hero to manifest the characteristics they need to manifest. So the adversary, and remember I said the trickster very often can come across as an adversary. You'll see some stories where that happens because they're not only a prototype to the hero, they're also a prototype of the villain. Um, the adversary is essential because it's a catalyst for this heroic transformation. If you don't have an adversary, if you don't have a situation that causes you to change, then you're not really dealing with a hero story at all, right? So this is the catalyst to that transformation. The second essential element is the conquest of death, okay? Now, I specifically call it the conquest of death because it could literally be a conquest of death, but it could also be, you know, talking about death in, a, in a, a, a different sense, metaphorically, okay? And the hero will very often reach a point where everything is on the line. This is usually the darkest place they arrive in their quest, and they need to, to conquer that thing. They need to conquer this ultimate... Um, ultimate thing. I can't think of a better word for it. And in their victory they're going to complete their transformation. So this is the point, usually at the end of the story, where the hero has 
manifest for the first time, okay? So you need an adversary as a catalyst for transformation. You need a conquest of death for the completion of the transformation. Those are essentials. But there are lots of other elements in the hero narrative. As a matter of fact, lots of writers have ex observed how hero stories work out according to certain patterns. And different writers have emphasized different patterns. And I'm going to give you a few different options. I'm going to start with a very generic common pattern or elements that you might find within the heroic narrative. So I'll call these the heroic narrative common elements. All right, now, I'll read through these and then, you know, I've gotten some visuals here so you could hopefully identify some of these things if you're familiar with some of these stories. But the unique birth is a pretty common pattern. And I'll just read through these first and we could talk about them briefly as we go and I'm going to actually apply these to a particular series of movies in a second. But you've got a unique birth that the hero often goes through which is not necessarily the birth itself, but it's usually something unique about the early childhood um, or beginning of the character. Then you usually have some kind of exile, which is a removal of the character from one world, uh, the world where they're actually born into, and maybe you know, it involves a loss of identity, which is the third thing, this idea of mystery of identity, not knowing who they are. Then you've got the idea of a prophecy or a destiny, sometimes revealed. A lot of these stories are gonna have prophecies and a sense of purpose is going to be brought along with that prophecy. In these early phases, you're also going to have the mentor figure that is going to come along and, and, and develop the character, prepare the character for the tasks that lay ahead. And then at some point early on, there's the call to adventure. The call to adventure, sometimes it's refused, sometimes it's embraced, sometimes it's refused and then embraced. But this is what's going to bring you into the main portion of the heroic narrative. The, all the various activity um, is usually in the phase of adventure, uh, the journey, right, the quest. So the heroic journey can manifest in, in multiple forms. Sometimes heroes go on multiple journeys. Uh, sometimes there are multiple quests. But the quest is the thing that you're after. This is the ultimate goal, um, the boon, as it's sometimes referred to. And what it is may vary from story to story, but very often it's symbolic of really one important quest that, that we're all after, and we'll get to that later. Then you've got the next phase, bringing these up, the impossible task. That's a motif that we'll see very often where a character is assigned a task that might not literally be impossible, but is meant to be impossible. I'll break that down later because we're going to see a lot of those. Sometimes along the way, they're going to have a challenge of the opposite sex, something that could be a distraction from their journey. Sometimes it could be assistance along the way. Sometimes they'll get supernatural aid, some kind of god or magic item or something that comes along to help them. Then there's often a redemption. That is a very big part of stories, whether it's a redemption of the character or redemption of a family member. Sometimes it has to do with the, the character's father. Uh, then by the end of the story, there's often a homecoming, right? A return, sometimes a tragic end. A lot of the most famous and favorite characters out there don't have a happy ending. You know, you're used to kind of the Disney world where, you know, the, the good guy, uh, you know, rides off into the sunset at the end of the story. But in a lot of the traditional stories, even the best hero gets home and dies a tragic death, you know, Heracles being one that always comes to mind. And if you've only seen the Disney movie Hercules, then you have no idea what I'm talking about, but we'll get to him later. And then an apotheosis. If you don't know what that is, an apotheosis is basically the idea of becoming divine or becoming greater, um, kind of a spiritual transformation. Could happen along the way, could happen at the very end. Again, using Heracles as an example, if you know the story, he becomes a god after he dies, his tragic death at the end. It's an apotheosis moment, All right? So that's a general uh, collection of common elements, and they're often in that order. But again, every story is unique and can break the order and you know remove pieces and add pieces. It, you know, there's no right way to do the heroic narrative, but you're going to see these patterns manifest over and over and over again, which is kind of neat. And you could ask the question, why? You know, why do we see these patterns set up? And that's what we're going to look at for the rest of the evening. Okay, so hopefully those make sense. Let's do this. Let's take those elements and let's use them as a guide to investigating Star Wars. Now, not everybody is a fan of Star Wars. And if you are a fan of Star Wars, you're not a fan of every trilogy in the entire Star Wars saga. There, I'm using the word. When I grew up, you know, there was only episodes four, five, and six. You know, when I first saw episode four, you know, it wasn't even called, you know, A New Hope. That was kind of the subtitle. It was just called Star Wars. <laughs> and uh, I saw it at a drive-in theater. 
uh, as a kid, and some of you don't even know what a drive-in theater is, but um, you know, at my age, you know, those are they, they were fantastic. The rest of my family actually fell asleep watching the movie, but I stayed awake for the whole thing. And then you have the you know, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, the original three movies, and a lot of people that are Star Wars fans will say those are the best of all the Star Wars movies that have been made. If you have comments, you could text these. I know a lot of people have strong feelings about Star Wars, but what I want to do is I want to walk through each of the trilogies and see how they conform to the pattern or how various characters conform to the pattern. And I'm going to start with the first trilogy, right? So I've got the, uh, the elements that we just looked at listed right there next to the picture of Luke Skywalker. So let's take a look at episode four, five, and six. The, six. the main character, clearly Luke. All right, when you talk about a unique birth, we don't really know about his birth in those movies. You find out more about him and his birth, I guess, in Return of the Jedi, but also in the prequel trilogy. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you guys. I mean, I guess I could ask you if you guys want to, you know, text, you know, what's unique about his birth. I'm probably not going to wait around for your responses. But, you know, there was something unique about how he was born. He was part of a pair of twins, right? That's unique. You're going to see a lot, that a lot in hero mythology, by the way. A lot of the great heroes were born as twins. Romulus and Remus, Castor and Pollux, even Heracles is born as one of a pair of twins. Okay, so Luke and Leia, same type of thing. Um, their mother, right, dies in childbirth. Their father, you know, has nothing to do. He's already been removed from the picture. The children are then brought into exile, right? They're separated at birth, Luke, in particular, is brought to this desert planet of Tatooine, and he's raised as an, you know, a moisture farmer uh, by his uncle. Doesn't really know anything about who he is. It's this mystery of identity. And there's a prophecy that keeps coming back over and over in these movies, this idea of you know, someone is destined to bring balance to the force. Oops, I should be bringing up some photos. There's Tatooine, right? He has no idea about the nobility of his past. Um, the mentor figure is going to come into the picture. So he has various mentors. Mentors would be a teacher, a trainer, a tutor, you know, Obi-Wan initially. And then when Obi-Wan's out of the picture, then Yoda comes in. Of course, Yoda will go out of the picture at a certain point too because the mentor always disappears from the story so that the hero has to stand on their own. And there's a call to adventure. In the very first movie, episode four, it's clear that, you know, this is a message, you know, Obi-Wan, you know, we need help, help us, Obi-Wan, or whatever she says. I forget the exact line. And that's the call to adventure. It's going to start the whole story off in a direction. And that first part of the story is usually pretty brief, right? The call to adventure usually happens pretty early on. And then you've got all kinds of things along the way. You've got journeys and quests and traveling through the galaxies and uh, impossible tasks all over the place. Along the way, Luke has an encounter with the opposite sex. It's kind of unique. Now that's, again, the photo of the you know, adventure in space. But the unique challenge of the opposite sex here happens to be who? And why is it a challenge is the next question. Right? How many of you are familiar with these movies? If you haven't already fallen asleep. Yeah, that's his sister, right? This, uh, that's obviously a problem. Doesn't know it. That's part of the mystery of identity. He comes to learn this later. But luckily, nothing happens beyond this kiss. This is kind of, you know, as far as it goes. Along the way, of course, supernatural aid, the force, right? He's got, con you know, not control of it, but he's you know, being led and guided by the force. There's a big redemption motif that comes in at the end of the story. This has to do with his relationship with his father, this really is the most important theme in the entire Star Wars saga, right? So this idea of Darth Vader, you find out, hopefully I'm not spoiling it, but the movie has been out for so long, you should all know that Darth Vader is his father by now. Um, various versions of a homecoming. Um, that's not one that's too clear because it's in a, kind of an ongoing series of movies. Uh, Luke himself doesn't have a tragic end, but you do have a lot of characters that have tragic ends, including his father. And an apotheosis would be, you know, what happens after they die. So here's the famous scene at the end of Return of the Jedi where you've got Obi-Wan, Yoda, and Anakin, you know, his father. If you have not seen the original cut of the movie, you might not recognize that particular actor playing the dead Darth Vader. But they've gone on to become these force ghosts, right? They're, they're, they've gone on to become greater than they were. As a matter of fact, in the scene where Obi-Wan is struck down in the beginning of the movie by Darth Vader, he, he makes very clear. He says, if you strike me down, I will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. It's this idea that there's something greater beyond this life. Okay, so pretty standard hero stuff. Uh, by the way, if you look at the top of the screen, I didn't even mention this, and I should have, because it says Lucas and Campbell at the top. George Lucas is the guy that created Star Wars. Uh, Joseph Campbell is the mythologist who influenced Lucas in a lot of ways. He was one of the great 
um, writers on mythology in the 20th century, died back in the 1980s. But he wrote a work that I probably mentioned before, A Hero of a Thousand Faces. And that was really instrumental in guiding Lucas into how to put together this heroic story. Okay, so um, very much influenced by Campbell's pattern. We'll talk about Campbell later. All right, so that's the first series. Then you've got the prequel trilogy. Now, I don't think it's as good as the original. Some people disagree. But whatever your ideas about it, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to walk through another character. The other really important character is Anakin Skywalker. Right? So Luke for the first three movies, Anakin for the prequel trilogy. This is his father. This is the character that's Darth Vader. They have the unique birth. Okay, If you don't know, it's basically the virgin birth motif. Right, so Anakin doesn't actually have a father at all. So it's even more miraculous than Luke's birth. Um, as far as exile, he really doesn't know anything about himself. He's born into the condition of slavery, has no idea about his connection to the Force. So there's this whole mystery of identity. Again, the prophecy of bringing balance to the Force is still there. He's got various mentor figures that come along. I love that photo because you get the young boy Anakin with the Darth Vader shadow. Um, by the way, I, I'll probably talk about this later. Actually... I will talk about it right now, just in case I forget to later. But if you ever study um, the epic tradition, one of the characteristics of epic storytelling is when you begin the story in the middle, okay? In medias res is, is the term. You may have come across this in a high school literature class. So the Iliad, the Aeneid, um, the Odyssey, a lot of these famous stories begin in the middle, and then they'll kind of catch you up later. And that's what Lucas does. When he starts with episode four, I think he does this for a reason. Uh, it gets you right to the core of the story without all the stuff that you need to lead you up to it. And then he goes back and fills that in later. For him, it was years and years later. But I want you to think about, those of you that have seen episodes one through three, when you first watch episode one, there's this little kid who really isn't that interesting, if you think about it. You're not, he's not compelling. There's nothing you're at all interested in with regard to the character, except for one thing. There's only one thing that makes this character interesting, and it's what? Why do you care at all about this young boy, Anakin Skywalker? I know somebody can answer this question. And it has to do with what you should already know about him before you even turn on the movie. He's Darth Vader, right? You're already introduced to the character. Darth Vader is interesting. Anakin's not. So that's a, a one good reason that you don't want to start with episode one. Very good. You nailed it. Good. Okay, so as we go, mentor figures, you know, young Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, a number of characters like that. You've got the call to adventure. You've got the quests, lots of quests and journeys, impossible tasks. And then the really interesting challenge of the opposite sex. Again, for him, it's a relationship that he's really not supposed to have because a Jedi is called to a life of celibacy. It's like being a monk. Okay, so here he is falling in love with, you know, um, Queen Amidala and Padme, and eventually they get married kind of in secret, which is going to be a problem, right? When you're breaking the core oaths of a Jedi, it's, it's showing you what's happening with the character, and it's really a downward spiral in, the, a spiral in the beginning, which is why he's going to need a redemption motif. Of course, the redemption came in the earlier episodes, right? So here's the moment from Return of the Jedi when Darth Vader takes the Emperor and apparently, <laughs> at the time we all thought, he kills the Emperor, but he only apparently killed the Emperor, as we found out now. But, um, you know, that's his redemption mo moment, the, re the reunion with his son. He dies in doing this, so it's his tragic end and an apotheosis. So, again, here's the edited Return of the Jedi, where they've taken out the other actor and put in um, uh, Hayden Christensen in his place, which I always hate when they re-edit films. Um, I guess the original actor is not earning any residuals when they do that. Okay, so that's the prequel trilogy, but it follows the pattern. Whether it does a good job, that's another question. It follows the pattern. And then you've got the most recent trilogy. And this is probably the most controversial of, I don't know, that, I guess it's up to the individual whether they think this is controversial. I, it started off, I thought, pretty good. Episode 7 was pretty good. They were kind of going back to the original formula, which a lot of people thought they abandoned in the earlier movies, the prequels. By the time you get to episode 8, I think they were going off in a direction where they were trying to break the rules of hero narrative, and I thought that was a really bad move. When it comes to episode nine, some people hated it because it does actually almost like a you know at one eighty, um, kind of what they laid down in the in the in episode eight. They kind of ignore it 
or re-explain it in episode nine. And I think it was an attempt to save the trilogy from utter destruction. But what I liked about it, and I might be in the vast minority, is that they went back to the heroic pattern, which is what they abandoned earlier on. So this idea of a unique birth. In episode eight, if you know anything about the character of Rey, you know, they basically made it out that she, you know, is a nobody. She doesn't have any in- interesting birth story. Uh, she doesn't have any interesting parents, no interesting background. And traditional heroes, that's not very common. So they revamped it and they gave her a unique birth, right? They gave her this idea that she's in exile. She doesn't have contact with who her parents were and more importantly, who her grandfather was. So that whole mystery of identity is revealed at the last movie. And we find out that she's the granddaughter of the emperor who happens to not be dead, okay? I like that they did that. You might not. Mentor figures. You know, she had to become a Jedi. They introduced, again, Luke comes back, even Leia. They're both involved in her training. Okay, so she has the mentors. And, of course, both of them pass from the story because, again, the mentor needs to disappear before the hero can manifest. You've got various calls to adventure, journeys, and possible tasks. The challenge of the opposite sex might be the thing they did the best in the movie, and it's her relationship with... Um, Kylo Ren, right, who happens to be the grandson of Darth Vader. And that whole relationship, it, it's very interesting. It's very different. But I like the way they played that out. And it ends up being something that is going to lead to this redemption motif. And the redemption actually isn't for her so much as it is for him. And it has to do, again, with the father relationship, which is, again, over and over again. It's, it has to do with his relationship to his grandfather, his perception of his grandfather, his relationship to his father, and I know if you don't know the movie, he kills his father, who happens to be Han Solo, probably one of the greatest characters in all of the movies. And I like the way they brought him back in the last movie as a memory, right? He's not really back, but it's kind of him in his own head going through his relationship with his father. And it's kind of the point where he breaks and he, he, he is redeemed, right? This is what happened to Darth Vader. It's that, it's that relationship with the family that's essential to the transformation. So again, a transformation tale, okay? The homecoming for Rey, for Rey at the end, she actually goes back to Tatooine, right, where Luke was from and kind of takes the name Skywalker and you've got kind of a happy ending, no tragic end for her, but of course, you know, apotheosis for various other characters along the way, right? So I think all of the trilogies in the series, in the saga, conform to the model, they all have a lot of these you know, common elements. The essential elements are in there as well, but I'm just kind of highlighting the common ones for now. So hopefully that, that makes sense. That's what I want you guys to look for as you're doing your movie analysis papers, right? You're going to pick a movie other than Star Wars, uh, since I just kind of watched you guys through it. I don't remember if I told you you could use Star Wars or not, but um, if I did, I'm going to retract that. Don't use Star Wars movies. Um, too easy once I already walk you through a little bit of it, though there's obviously a lot more that can be said for all of these. Okay, so let's move on and talk a little bit about the transcendent purpose of the heroic narrative. Okay, the narrative is pedagogical, and I gave you functions of mythology earlier this semester, and I said pedagogical function is the function where myth is serving to walk you through various watersheds in your life, right? To walk you through the points of your normal human development and educate you along the way and teach you, okay, for lack of a better word. It's kind of like an initiation. It's, it's a way of being initiated without going through some kind of ritual. You could be initiated through story, okay? So I'm going to often use a comparison between initiations and transformations because, by the way, initiation rituals are rituals about human transformation. So these stories are what we call didactic literature. And if you don't know what didactic means, it simply means they're there to teach you. They teach you something. And there's all kinds of different di- you know, forms of didactic literature. Narrative is just one of them. And it happens to be the most powerful form of didactic literature. Of course, you could pick up a textbook from mathematics, and that's technically didactic as well. It's not very compelling, right? You're not going to sit around and uh, read a mathematics textbook for fun. And most likely, you're not going to have a motion picture made out of a mathematics textbook. And that's because images and narrative are much more persuasive than just propositions, right? I like that phrase. Images are more persuasive than propositions. A proposition is just a claim, 
right? Like um, I can even make a moral claim, like you ought to do your homework or you ought to treat people with respect, right? It's one thing to try to teach somebody with just the phrase, you ought to treat people with respect. That's not going to do a lot to actually get somebody to do that or to live that kind of life. Often they need something more powerful. Um, If I give you a story about why, you know, maybe a story illustrating what happens when you don't treat somebody with respect, it's going to be a lot more powerful and you're going to remember the lesson a little bit better. It's going to hit you on a deeper level. That's the idea of the narrative. They engage your emotions as well as your mind. Okay. That's what the whole idea of visuals. I mean, I, I, I know you don't have to have visuals in the work for me to talk about images because the, the literature itself will create images in your mind, right? It's not, it doesn't have to be a comic book that you're reading. Then the narrative is also working on multiple levels. So we could basically distinguish several different levels that the narrative is working on. And I'm going to use the same um, letter for each of these just to help it stick a little bit better. So you could talk about the style level. This would be the descriptive level. So for Star Wars, we could say on the style level, we could say it's science fiction, fantasy, kind of mixed together, right? You get outer space. It's kind of the uh, level that if you're going to describe it to somebody, you know, you could tell the difference between a Western and a science fiction movie or something set in the Middle Ages. You know, you know uh, Game of Thrones is kind of a medieval fantasy type of a thing. That's the style level, okay? Some people are attracted at that level and, you know, certain people like one style, might not like another style, but that's not the most important level to analyze a story at. Beyond the style level, you've got the supposition level, okay? I should say maybe not beyond it, but deeper than the style level is the supposition. The supposition or presupposition has to do with the worldview that the story expresses, and it's going to have to do with all of your beliefs that undergird the nature of the story world. So using Lord of the Rings, right? Lord of the Rings is a fantasy, um, you know, medieval fantasy type style, but the supposition level is going to have to do with the world of magic and values and all that kind of stuff that makes the story make sense, it undergirds the entire story. And you have to buy into the worldview of the story for you to really be able to engage with the story. All right, if you're the type of person that says, it's, you know, I, I, I just don't think that's real, um, well, partly you're missing the point, right? You don't want to say, you know, it's, Lord of the Rings is not a believable story because I don't believe in magic. No, it's the whole idea is you have to suspend your disbelief. You have to buy into the worldview, and then you analyze it, you know, with those assumptions in the background. But there are always assumptions in the background of these stories. So that's the supposition level. Then you've got the significance level. And this is really the most important level in that the message, the meaning, the truth that's trying to be communicated comes across at that level, right? So, you know, Lord of the Rings obviously is trying to say something about good versus evil, right? It's supposed to be saying something about uh, sacrificial activities and making the world a better place, standing up against, you know, the darkness in various things. I'm, I'm simplifying it. It's much deeper than that. But that's the significance level. There are lessons that you learn. Okay. And then the fourth level is the symbol level. This, I would say, is the archetypal transparency through which you're supposed to see the, the greater world. So when you see, um, if you remember the lecture, if you haven't watched it yet, if you weren't um, here, uh, I did the lecture on uh, Loki, and I talked about the scene where Loki is captured by Thor, and I said the archetype there, the motif there is the strong man versus the shapeshifter, and I discussed how that could be a symbol or symbolic conflict that represents the whole idea of endurance. So when I say you look at it on a symbolic level, when you go through your life and you see a situation where you're thinking about quitting, um, that's the type of image that should come back to mind and, and help you look at the world in a different way. You can see it through the motif that, you know, I need to be like Thor. I need to be like the hero that grabs a hold and doesn't give up. Okay, so it brings out, you know, some great significance in the world. Um, so again, it's an application level. So it should make a difference in your, your own life. And that's, again, what we want to come back to with all these stories anyways. They should make a difference in your life. Okay, so those are the four levels that the narrative works at. Then we could talk about existential function. So why are these stories so powerful? Well, it has to do with how the story hits you, kind of in the gut. It's an experiential relationship to the ideas that are embedded in the story. You don't just listen to a story. You don't just read a story. The truths that are in the story get to you because you participate in some way in the story. You live the story, kind of vicariously, right? 
as you watch the story, you put yourself into the hero's shoes. You try to identify with them on an emotional level. It might be what we call a cathartic experience. If you're not familiar with the term catharsis, you know, Aristotle uses the term when he's talking about drama, right? The Greek theater. And he talks about this idea of purging of, you know, negative emotions, right? You go to the theater and you, you cry, you get fearful, your emotions are engaged. And it's something purifying. Uh, if you ever go to the, a horror movie, right? How many of you guys like horror movies? You know, if you, if you, if you enjoy horror movies, um, part of the fun is that you jump, you get nervous, you are on the edge of your seat. There's something that's affecting you. And that's really the way you're supposed to enjoy a good story. You don't just watch it, you get into it. And that's where it actually leads to your own transformation. As a matter of fact, studies have been shown or uh, studies have been done that show people that think about certain types of scenarios. Say, let's just use the idea of a, a fearful scenario. If you kind of run mentally through scenarios that you might be afraid of or think about how you might deal with this scenario should it happen or read that type of material where you see these scenarios play out you're actually better equipped to deal with those fearful scenarios in your real life, okay? Because that kind of mental activity is a way of training you to become courageous, okay? You don't have to just go out there and do the courageous thing. You could actually prepare for it through story. Um, let me see. Okay. Uh, you're a participant, right? That's the whole idea is you're going to participate in the myth and you're not just going to watch it. Therefore, it's transformative. This whole idea of engaging in the story leads to your own transformation. Not just a transformation of the hero. It's the transformation of the person putting themselves in the hero's position, right? You experience in the story opens you up to different aspects of reality. You can call them spiritual aspects if you want, uh, though I'm not using this in any religious sense, okay? Okay. Um, Human needs are often met. You know, a lot of people that study religion talk about um, how human needs are met in various religious traditions and even in the secular world. So, for instance, I know Mercy Laude very much talks about how we get our needs met in these transcendent experiences. And if it's not in religion, it could be in, you know, sports. It could be in going to the theater. It can be in engaging in these things that are, uh, take ourselves out of our normal, ordinary, everyday existence and connect with something beyond ourselves. That's the whole idea of transcendence. Okay, so this transcendent experiments, uh, experience and entertainment pulls us out of the mundane world into some world that's special. Okay, and it's really a powerful experience. And it's this immersion into this world that is, you know, the key to personal transformation. Okay, so that's the idea of the existential aspect of the hero story. And I'm going to come back to initiation, right? So initiation as a ritual has to do with a transition from one stage of life to another. These stories are about initiation. The myth, the legend, the hero story is supposed to educate the soul in a certain way. What I mean by soul is really the deep, you, right? This is the basis of psychology. The word soul in Greek is psuche, uh, and it's the root for psychology. So the origin of psychology actually comes out of kind of the philosophy of the soul that you get in earlier thinkers like Plato and Aristotle and people beyond that. The idea is that you're communicating maybe universal moral principles through these stories, right? You're trying to teach something. It could be societal values. It could be universal values, like I said. And it's a useful tool to teach these things, but it's supposed to move you to becoming a virtuous individual, right? Or embedding these um, values and virtues in you. And it's not by just telling you, oh, this is how you ought to live or this is how you ought to behave. The reason it's so effective is because it's giving you a calling, right? It aids you. And the idea of virtue, if you're not familiar again with, I guess, Aristotelian philosophy, is a virtue is a perfection, it's a characteristic that is in a better state than was originally there, right? Nobody is born with virtues, according to Aristotle. Nobody is born courageous. You develop that. You perfect your emotions to become something that you weren't. And one of the keys is needing a calling. We need to be called to this life of adventure, right? You need to be called to living above where you are. Right? You need to be connected to some kind of purpose beyond yourself, a, a transcendent purpose. That's why these stories are inspirational. The hero engages in a fight, a struggle. And a lot of people have analyzed you know, human society and the history of humanity as you know, one 
crusade after another, meaning a fight. You know, people, you know, take on different um, challenges. We, we tend to be, obviously, people that like comfort on one hand, but at the same time, you tend to become apathetic or live a less than authentic human life if you're not engaged in some kind of struggle that you can identify with. You just watch the news and you see people, you know, fighting for different causes all the time. There's always another one right behind. And even though you think you've figured out this one thing, this one problem, you know, you pick up another struggle. People tend to be, I don't want to say violent, but we, there's a side of humanity that tends to look for fights, okay? And hopefully that fight is something of value. You know, you don't want to just fight for no reason. You know, he see it when we talked about the ages of man, talks about the Bronze Age, which these are just people that fight because they love to fight. But the Hero Age, those are the people that fight for a cause. They fight for a reason. They um, struggle, okay? So that's what we need. We need something beyond ourselves to help us move in the direction of virtue and to become what we need to be. So we are the hero at the end of the day, right? That's the whole idea is we're initiated into the hero's adventures. We identify with the hero and... Hopefully we're changed. This is very much the pattern of an initiation ritual, which I'll talk about more a little bit later. Okay, so that is, in a nutshell, part one of the lecture on hero myths. When we pick up part two of the lecture, we're going to be dealing with the monomyth. Okay.